everyone and welcome. This is Michael Conley, HP CareerNet. It's Friday again. So it's time for a webinar. Um, today we've got um, Dr. Debbie Norris. Uh, Joe, would you like to introduce her and then I'll uh, do a little housekeeping notes on uh, asking questions, slides, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Uh, Dr. Norris is the founder and executive director of the Mindfulness Center. She has trained extensively in mind-body therapies, ranging from traditional medical and psychotherapeutic practices to holistic and integrative therapies and lifestyle practices. A health scientist with over 30 years of experience in research, clinical application, and education, Dr. Norris brings meditation and other lifestyle wellness programs to the forefront of your health plan. Super. Thanks, Joe. So let me say, uh, let's see, if you want to ask questions, you can type them into the questions box, or um, you can also raise your hand, although most people don't like to talk. <laughs> I don't know why, you know, I like to talk. Um, and let's see, this is being recorded, it will be available on Health Promotion Live uh, right after the webinar, and the slides are already up there, so if you want to jump over uh, and grab the slides to make notes on or whatever, uh, that's just fine. So, I think that's all I've got. Debbie, are you ready to get started? I sure am, Michaela. Thank Great. you very much for having me on HP CareerNet today. You're welcome. Okay. Well, and thanks to all the viewers and listeners who are interested in the concept of meditation, and particularly in, in today's talk about the role of meditation in healing and medicine. Um, meditation is obviously a very old practice. We understand historically that people have been meditating for thousands of years, and we'll discuss what that means to have a meditation practice. Um, and it's also been used as a healing practice for thousands of years. And very exciting recent research has shown us some of the, you know, we're interested in our culture and the mechanism of action of how these things work in our body, what, what happens when we meditate in our body that makes it a healing modality, and so that's what we're going to explore. Thank you. The first thing we're going to consider in terms of meditation is um, the mechanism, mechanism of action in terms of meditation as a therapy. We'll also look at the clinical basis of um, the application of meditation for specific conditions and diseases. And then I'll introduce you to the practice of meditation, um, what it means, what that is, a practice. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to do our little uh, poll. Shall I go ahead and launch those now? Oh, thank you, Michaela. That would be helpful. Okay. I'd like to know about the listening audience so I can address your interests primarily. All righty. So as, there, as you do that, should I, shall I go ahead and talk about the next slide? Uh, actually, it, it takes away the screen, so um, you can just hang on. I just, I just put up, uh, do you currently practice meditation, yes or no? We'll just give them a couple minutes to uh, respond. Thanks. No, oh, I say minutes. I really mean seconds. Okay. All righty, we've got um, greater than 80%, so I will close that poll. And then I will share the results. So it looks like 58% uh, do, in fact, currently practice meditation. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. So um, shall I go ahead and launch the other one as well? Sure. All right. The other one is right here. And it is, are you interested in participating? Are you, are you interested in practicing and, or using meditation? Answer one is yes personally, yes for my business, no idea how meditation could be used, <laughs> it could help me personally, uh, no idea how it might be used for business. All right, we've got 81, more than 80%, so I'll give you two 
one. I'm going to close the poll and share the results. And I see that 54% do uh, use meditation personally, 38% uh, for business, 4% not so sure on how it might help them personally, and another 4% not so sure about how it might help their business. Well, I hope this talk helps everybody understand and those who are already using it and understand have a deeper understanding and, and able to talk about the clinical research, the evidence basis for doing so. Thank you. Great. Shall I proceed? Please. Okay. Well, one of the key things going on in our culture right now is elevated levels of stress, and we'll see that meditation plays a huge role here. Recent data and uh, medical research is pointing to the role of stress in the development of all kinds of chronic illnesses and diseases. It's, of course, associated with um, high levels of inflammation. And in 2004, Time Magazine did an article on the major causes of disease in our culture, everything from heart disease, cancer, arthritis, diabetes, and much more, are inflammatory inflammatory related diseases and inflammation is exacerbated by stress. So what I've shown here is the brain's response to stress. Um, the hypothalamus is the, is the trigger point in the brain. It's like an alerting center in our brain that's constantly on the watch for us. Is there a need for us to react drastically to our environment? We call that the fight or flight response. Is there a need for the fight or flight response? And when the hypothalamus gets alerted, it sends a message to the pituitary gland, which then sends a message to the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands send out, as, an, as part of the endocrine system, send out a global notice to the entire body that there is a threat to our survival, either the need for food or the need to run for safety. Um, and the whole body reacts globally to what we call the stress response. This global effect affects all kinds of other systems. It affects our sex hormones, our reproductive system. Um, in a time of fight or flight or stress, we do not need to be focusing our energies on our reproductive system. If our, if our survival is at stake for one reason or another, um, our system will shut down its efforts to maintain the uh, reproductive hormones. But we also see these effects in terms of mineral corticoids. Mineral corticoids are involved in things like um, laying down of bone, bone deposits. So under situations of chronic stress, when mineral corticoids are disrupted, people will develop things like osteoporosis, um, bone and joint problems. Um, the glucocorticoids, like cortisol, elevated levels of cortisol, the stress hormone in particular. We also see elevated levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and these are involved in major functions like heart rate and, and respiratory rate and so forth. So a lot of um, heart conditions, I've, I've worked with groups of people who have heart conditions, and one of them is uh, palpations. The heart's fluttering. The heart seems irregular and it's beating too fast. This is actually not a not a problem initiated by the heart, but it goes back to the adrenal glands and then back to the hypothalamus from our perception of stress causing excess adrenal release, which overstimulates the heart. Um, it's functional in a time, you know, a fight or flight. You're going to have great physical action. You want the heart beating quickly. You want to have blood pumping. You want oxygen flowing to your muscles and so forth. But it's not functional the way it occurs under what we just call distress or anxiety in our culture. <clears throat> Cortisol, one of the hormones that I mentioned, is a steroid hormone produced in the adrenal glands, released in response to stress, and it functions specifically to increase blood pressure. It suppresses the immune system, though not necessarily inflammatory reactions. And you see diurnal variations in cortisol levels that are natural throughout the day. They start rising um, and peak actually in the, in the morning, and then they start coming back down over the day. A day. Um, and so there are natural fluctuations in cortisol levels. However, excess stress disrupts these natural variations, um, causing health conditions. So here's some of the other physiological responses to stress. Now, I've, I've put these in two columns. The column on the left shows short-term um, immediate responses to stress. 
And the column on the right shows more long-term effects. But immediately, when the hypothalamus um, perceives stress, you see an increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure, the pupils dilate. There's an increase in oxygen consumption. Inflammatory processes increase. Uh, mental, mental focus is increased. So there's actually a narrowing in the perspective of what's being perceived and an intense focus on one thing. Um, and digestion decreases. Now with chronic stress, over a long period of time, we start to see other problems develop like decreases in bone mineralization, as I mentioned, decreases in sex hormone, decreases in growth hormone. And you might think, well, that's not so bad. I'm, I'm past the growing stage. But growth hormone plays a very important role to us um, at all stages of life. It's actually a hormone involved in healing. So anytime we're always generating new cells, we're all, and you develop a muscle, we shred the muscle cells, and new muscle cells grow, this requires growth hormone. Um, in learning, neuroplasticity, new neurons are, are developing and growing. And this requires growth hormone. Bone, bone is constantly replenishing itself as the osteoblasts give rise to new bone cell. This requires growth hormone. So long-term effect of stress is basic, takes a wear and tear on the body. Also, we mentioned a decrease in reproductive hormones. Now, why does this come up in a lecture on meditation? Now that we understand the etiology, some of the mechanism of action of where some of our health conditions come from, we can start to look at the role of meditation as an antidote, as a clinical therapy for the underlying basis of many medical conditions. Uh, a lot of research on meditation and other relaxation modalities has been done by Herbert Benson up at Harvard at the Benson Mind-Body Institute. What we found is that the relaxation response is incompatible with the stress response. They are opposites. You can either go one way or another. You can't turn both left and right. You go one way or the other. The issue with stress, if I can back up for a moment again here, it's not that all stress is bad. There is, of course, distress. We all find distress unpleasant. And then there's what we call eustress. We seek out certain forms of stress. We play competitive games. We take on life's challenges. We, we go on adventures. This is eustress. It's pleasurable, it's periodic, and then it goes away. Distress is uncomfortable. It's the same level of energy, but it doesn't feel good. And the other, the other part of it is it doesn't necessarily go away. We have not found stress in and of itself to be a health problem. We've found the inability to let go of stress over long periods of time, what we refer to as chronic stress. That is where we see stress as a predictor of disease. So it's chronic existence. So we're not trying to eliminate stress altogether. If you want to take on challenges, if, if, you know, certainly I work with a lot of kids in graduate school, they've taken on certain challenges in life. That's not a bad thing. It's the inability to relax intermittently and let it go. So what we see with meditation is a practice that either comes naturally to some or can be developed that allows for periodic times of letting go of stress and relaxing. And with training, we can enter the relaxation response more quickly and perhaps more deeply. Um, but the point is a nice balance of both. So how do we, what do we see when we look at the relaxation response? We see physiologically the opposite of what we found with the stress response, a decrease in the oxygen demand. And over a period of time, you'll see people start to breathe, although deeply, very gently. That's a very slow pace of breath. You see, that, so a decrease in the respiratory rate, a decrease in blood pressure, an increase in an overall sense of well-being, and a reduction in the stress hormones in general. These are just a few of the primary physiological signs of the relaxation response. 
meditation. It's, uh, as I mentioned, a concept that's been around for a long time. It's a self-regulation practice. It is a practice. It's not a, a place or a state of being. It's a practice. It's designed to bring your mental processes under voluntary control via focused awareness and attention. And it's alert. There's a sense of alertness. Although deep relaxation can occur, the awareness stays present. That's what distinguishes it from the state of sleep. Um, I've had people who are deep in meditation. They're snoring away, but they're, I've, I've had it happen to myself. They're still conscious of what's going on in the world around them and their presence. But the body is so relaxed that it, go, it feels like it's in a state of sleep. Indeed, if you look at the electroencephalographic readings of what the brain is doing as you move from an alert, active state into the meditation state, that's the state that we typically see in people just before they fall asleep. And it's usually a very transient moment that you just pass through on your way to sleep after you've gone to bed. But in meditative practice, what we learn to do is linger there and draw that out and lengthen it. So that's something we know about the, the brain waves of meditative state. Now, I've often heard contemplation used in analogy with meditation. And I'd like to point out some differences between these various practices and modalities. Um, there's many different forms of meditation. What they all share in common is the use of a single point of focus for stilling the activity of the brain. As your focus calms to one point, many forms of meditation then let go of that single point of focus, and you simply become a body in a state of awareness. Awareness without intended thoughts, activities, intended mental function, just a body in a state of awareness. The various points of focus that are used in different forms of meditation include mantras, as with transcendental meditation, a sound, people use singing bowls, other sounds for entrainment, the breath, a specific visualization, or point of reflection, or empathy and compassion. Those are all points of focus where you could focus your awareness and attention to begin to calm down all the activity in the mind. Some of the concepts employed in developing this practice, you allow your thoughts or feelings and sensations to arise. If you struggle with them, if you try or make an effort not to have them, then you set up a dynamic of struggle, and that becomes where you spend your time. If you give up the effort of trying and just notice that these things are arising, invite them in, sit in awareness of them, then there you are, you're meditating. You simply become aware of a body in action. So there's no judgment of the sensory or cognitive processes as they come in. Um, and there's a, a sort of a meta-awareness or an observation of the ongoing content of thoughts. As thoughts will come up, thoughts will appear. There's another part of your brain that simply observes that that happens. There's been many studies on these various forms of meditation and a recent upsurge in the research on meditation in medicine and healing. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is well known for his early research on a program, um, MBSR, the um, mind-body stress release. Um, there's earlier data that was put out by the Maharishi on transcendental meditation. There was a plethora of this research done in the 70s and 80s, and it's still going on. It's been proven meditation plays a role in healing of myriad conditions. We've got data now on the role of meditation in everything from ADHD to asthma, the role of meditation in cancer and boosting the immune system, to epilepsy and controlling brain waves in the brain. Let's look at some of the specific risk factors 
that meditation affects in producing clinical benefits. Data shows that meditation actually boosts the function of our immune system. Um, we have many components to our immune system, way too innumerable to review just now, but these involve components such as natural killer cells, T cells, leukocytes, cytokines. All of these things are primed and enhanced, we see, in uh, studies with meditation. We look at, uh, for example, there was a recent study on meditation for people who received the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine was far more effective. You got higher titers um, and reactions to the flu vaccine in people who had been meditating. Um, we see reductions in inflammatory cytokines that lead, as I mentioned, to many forms of disease in people who are meditating. I think another area that's of interest is those people who have recently been diagnosed with cancer, the day they receive the cancer diagnosis, not the day they develop cancer. Cancer develops over a long period of time. But the day they receive the diagnosis, their immune system function plummets just when the immune system is needed the most. What we find in people who have been meditating prior to the day of diagnosis is this immune system function does not change. It does not drop. So meditation supports the function of immune function during a very stressful time, such as with the diagnosis of cancer. Meditation has also been shown to elevate serotonin levels. And we know of serotonin from our interest in serotonin um, as an antidepressant. Um, most of the antidepressant drugs are developed, SSRIs these days, to raise serotonin levels in our bodies. And lo and behold, meditation is a natural method for elevating serotonin levels. Uh, I find that, we'll discuss this later in the talk, but I find that of particular interest since serotonin was recently discovered to burst um, lymphoma cells, a form of cancer, specifically Burkett's lymphoma. Um, in the presence of higher levels of serotonin, these cells self-destruct. Apoptosis is what that's called. Um, Unfortunately, it was found that antidepressants were not capable of eliciting that effect. Indeed, they, antidepressants had the opposite effect. Um, however, meditation is a natural form of raising serotonin levels. Serotonin, as I mentioned, is involved in this type of lymphoma, but it's also involved in other diseases as well. Meditation has been shown to elevate melatonin levels. Um, it regulates sleep, it regulates your diurnal cycle, and it balances cortisol levels. Meditation has also been shown to elevate endorphin levels. These are the endogenous opiates in our bodies. So um, the endogenous opiates are our natural resources, our natural neuro neurochemicals for regulating pain, analgesia, um, and our emotional reactions to pain. And meditation improves those. It decreases cortisol and adrenaline, stress hormones. It balances our hormones. Um, it regulates, so we don't have excess levels of estrogens. We don't have decreased levels of testosterone. In the presence of meditation, does these levels balance. And it also balances our mineral levels. Um, people who are stressed tend to have diminished magnesium levels. Magnesium is essential in absorption and use of um, calcium. Uh, so meditation helps us to balance these sorts of minerals and others as well. Some of, so we've talked about the risk factors for diseases, and we've looked at how meditation plays um, a foundational role in mitigating risk factors for diseases. Let's consider some of the research that's been done on meditation and clinical outcome. I see that word's misspelled, but that's clinical outcome. Meditation has been significant and effective in its use in treating all kinds of diseases. We've 
there's data on clinical outcome for cancer. One of the first studies done by Kabat-Zinn on meditation, he looked at its role in, for people with eczema. Who would expect, at the, as, on the face of it, to see meditation affecting eczema? But lo and behold, he found that people who undertook an eight-week study of a relaxation methodology and meditation actually improved in their symptoms of eczema. I've mentioned the study on meditation and the flu, uh, in particular the flu vaccine. People uh, who meditate are in general less likely to develop seasonal colds and so forth. I will address in detail the role of meditation in the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We have a slide just for that, looking at the mechanism of how that occurs. There's considerable data now on meditation for symptoms of depression. And in my own practice, I have seen it to be very effective. As we mentioned, it elevates serotonin levels. Serotonin levels rise. Um, and it, it seems to counteract the basic feelings of helplessness and despair that are characteristic of depression in creating um, sensations of clarity of focus, inspiration, and um, greater levels of energy. Meditation, and uh, I'd like to say meditation and yoga here because much of the research that I've seen also incorporates elements of yoga for heart disease. Every single risk factor and every single type of heart condition has been addressed with yoga and meditation, and all of those are benefited. All of those risk factors and conditions are benefited by yoga and meditation according to the scientific literature. And the role of meditation has been examined in substance abuse. Um, all kinds of mechanisms are positive for why it's so effective in treating substance abuse, um, but it improves quality of life um, and ability to control one's own behaviors, one's own life and outcome. That seems to be a mechanism. Uh, considering that stress may be a contributing factor to the onset of substance abuse, behavioral strategies such as Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction and other forms of meditation can decrease stress and the anxiety that are associated with drug-taking activity. Uh, again, Kabat-Zinn's program is an eight-week MBSR program, and other programs have been looked at as well, but in this study it was specifically that one and found a significant decrease in cortisol levels and uh, decreases in self-reported stress and um, general improvements in quality of life. Meditation has been looked at in terms of treating chronic pain with cortisol as, a, as one of the biomechanistic pathways. Um, it was found meditation decreased pain perception and that again could have something to do with elevated endorphin levels. Um, it decreased chronic tension headaches. Uh, it normalizes plasma cortisol levels. It um, reduces pain severity and did so more effectively in drug control group looking at Xanax. So we've reviewed um, some of the risk factors that meditation affects. We've addressed some of the clinical outcome measures. I'd like to address some of the most recent and intriguing work on, um, and research on meditation. And again, this will be looking at, at sort of the underlying um, physiological effects of meditation. And, and one of those is the effects of meditation on the brain. We're actually seeing, in addition to functional changes, we're actually seeing structural changes in the brain of people who spend time in meditation. We're seeing growth in white matter and gray matter and dendritic growth specifically. Here's a study that looked at the effects of meditation on a very specific region of the brain, and there's other regions have been evaluated as well, but in this study they looked at the anterior cingulate cortex and found of course, the, the ACG plays a role in regulating our emotions, our mood, and our behavior. And that a regular um, meditation practice um, elicited increased activity in the 
anterior cingulate cortex, uh, compared to a control group, which was simply given relaxation training. Um, since we know that the ICC plays a role in attention deficit disorder and addiction, dementia, depression, schizophrenia, and chronic pain, we understand that being able to regulate activity in the ACC may give us some control over these roles of this part of the brain. We saw changes in white matter in the ICC. This was a study done on undergraduate students given regular um, meditation training. Um, they actually learned to control activity in this part of the brain. So at the suggestion, the subjects in, in, in some of these studies have learned to activate the ACC. And we've seen this with um, fMRI and, and PET scans and so forth. So with our intention, just as we know that with our intention, we can, for example, choose to breathe in deeply, choose to hold our breath, or choose to exhale. How is it that we do that? How is it that we can consciously choose to blink our eyes or contract a muscle? Well, from these studies, we're also finding that we can consciously choose to activate specific parts of our brain once we learn how to do that. Once we see when activation occurs, we can actually learn to activate specific parts of our brain and thus elicit the changes in behavior that those brain parts regulate. We've seen studies that look at specific changes in white matter, and now this study looks at specific changes in the gray matter in the brain, um, and found, again, in the posterior cingulate cortex that um, these parts of the brain could be activated as well. Here's a study that looked at um, uh, cortical thickness, uh, thickening of the cortex. Um, which was evaluated using MRI. And these subjects um, who had a regular practice, they exhibited lower pain sensitivity to controls, um, and that this decreased pain sensitivity was specifically associated with a thitter, thicker cortex. Um, and the, the longer the years of meditation experience, the thicker the gray matter in the cortex. So we're seeing that meditation plays a role in neuroplasticity, that it directs neuroplasticity, which we now know exists, and that we can get intentional control over brain activation. So here's another study by DeCharms et al. from 2005, where they evaluated what was going on in the brain using fMRI, um, and the perceived pain was correlated with the level of activation in the ACC, and that when participants deliberately evoked increases or decreases in this activation, there were proportional changes in perceived pain. So we're again seeing another study where people are learning to control what's going on in their brain and thus control what that part of the brain regulates. Chronic pain patients were able to individually control activation of the ACC and the corresponding level of pain, resulting in decreases in chronic pain in these patients after training. Here's another study, um, or more details on the study. So some of the functional changes um, that we observe from meditation in terms of what's going on in the brain. ADHD, Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's, bipolar, depression, anxiety, all of these things are affected. All of these things, we have data, randomized clinical controls data studies that show that meditation facilitates these functional changes in the brain. <clears throat> I mentioned I'd give you some details on ADHD. What you have on the left-hand column are the characteristics of ADHD taken from the DSM manual on diagnosing ADHD specifically. These are the characteristics by which ADHD is diagnosed. An inability to attend to detail 
or making careless mistakes in schoolwork and other activities. And I won't read through all six of these items, but you can read them there on your screen. What we have on the right-hand column is a separate body of literature, and this is an overview of the literature on the outcome and effects of meditation in general. In general, meditation results in improved executive fun functioning and alerting and orienting. And if you, and I again won't read all six just at this moment, but if you take a look and compare the column in the left with the column on the right, the characteristics of ADHD with the outcome effects of meditation, you see that one for one, they are the opposite. As if meditation is the ideal antidote for the symptoms of ADHD. Then the question is, well, if these are the general outcome effects of meditation, will these effects help somebody who actually has ADHD, who has a diminished capacity in these areas? And the answer is yes. I've seen that in the literature, and I've seen that in my personal work with people diagnosed with ADHD. It is an ideal antidote for these diagnostic symptoms of ADHD. I'll read through a few of them. Let's look at the second one. Difficulty sustaining attention in task, a symptom to use to diagnose ADHD. An outcome of meditation, increased attention regulation. ADHD, not seeming to listen when spoken to. Meditation, increased expressive attention. ADHD, not following through on instructions, failing to finish work, chores, duties. Meditation, increased motivation and ability to follow through on projects or stay on task. Um, ADHD, difficulty organizing tasks. Meditation, increased planning and ability to organize, and so forth. Um, Moving on to the second area uh, that I find absolutely fascinating, recent, most recent research on meditation and its structural changes. This work coming from Herbert Benson himself out of Harvard is the role that meditation plays in affecting our genes. His research and research of others, I've seen some out of um, Stanford and, and elsewhere, Santa Barbara, on how meditation affects our genes, our underlying genetic structure, and that it does. One of the things we know is it increases the release of telomerase, that's an enzyme involved in keeping our DNA intact. Now, if you've done any, if any of you work in the geriatric population and you do any research on aging, one of the characteristics of aging that we know is the breakdown of our genes. The telomeres aren't as long, the genes aren't as long, they start to break down. Telomerase is the enzyme responsible for maintaining the structural integrity of our genes. It puts the pieces together into that beautiful um, structure. We find that meditation increases levels of telomerase, the enzyme that puts our genes back together says something about its role in a, the role of meditation in aging. We've seen that meditation changes the gene response to stress and gene expression in general. Um, genes response to stress again, as with aging, it makes me even think that aging is simply enduring too much stress, um, which is unavoidable to some extent, but that genes start to break down the structure and the integrity of the, of the genes starts to erode. And we see with meditation that this is less likely to occur or it does not occur. Um, cell metabolism, one of the things that genes regulate, uh, slows down and functions more effectively in the presence of a meditative practice. Oxidative phosphorylation, that is the effects of oxidation is reduced and the generation of reactive oxygen species. Again, we, we talk about free radicals and oxidation. We take antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E to reduce uh, free radical damage. Um, in, in the case of people who meditate, this oxidative stress is reduced. So that along with some vitamin C and some vitamin E is basically good for your genes. 
So the role of meditation in terms of healing is that in general, it plays a role in restoring balance. It, um, it, it helps us find our adaptively ideal level of balance, whether it's the balance of the minerals in our body, the balance of the hormones in our bodies, the balance of gray matter to white matter, whatever it is, a sense of balance in our bodies. Um, we get that both in, physiologically, we see that in our physical measures, our, our biophysical measures, and we feel that. We, you experience, for the 54% that said they do have a regular practice, you know it enhances a sense of balance and control and overall wellness. Um, this sense of balance is, is interpreted or experienced, if you will, as a sense of peace or joy and comfort happiness, and even ultimately, sometimes we experience it as bliss. So that is the, there you go, the summation of the talk. And Michaela, I'd like to open it up to you and then any interaction that's appropriate with the audience at this moment in time. Super. Um, all right, so if you have questions, type them into the question box. Um, and let me pop this out here, and I can either read them, or if you want to raise your hand, um, you can also do that. I think I saw somebody's, nope, okay, uh, let's see, Sandy wants to know, for three hours of meditation on the first slide regarding the study, was it three hours all at once, or over a week, or or over time, Usually I guess. when it's just a, a one-time uh, thing like that, um, it it's, was a one-time event, a, a long-term meditation. When we look at meditation for research purposes, um, you can look at what's going on in the brain, particularly of experienced meditators, um, over one long session like that. If you're working with inexperienced meditators, in research we usually look a minimum of six weeks. Uh, most data comes from eight-week studies. Um, some are 10 and 12. Mm. Super, okay. Uh, have you seen any studies, oh, this is from uh, Keith, have you seen any studies relating to meditation and asthma? Oops, did you hear um, me? Yes, I did. And okay, I'm just sorry. thinking over who would have done this research. Um, and I'm sure it's effective because asthma is very much an inflammatory condition. Um, it's hypersensitivity to things that other people are not necessarily sensitive to and eventually can become chronic in and of its own. But it's usually stimulated by something in the environment. And stress definitely plays a role in the etiology and the development of asthma. Um, so reversing those symptoms with meditation and, and other ways of reducing the, eliciting the relaxation response certainly would be effective. Um, I'm trying, I can't think off the top of my head of specific uh, scientists who've done that research, but I do, I do feel confident if you look for that research, for example, on PubMed, you would find it. Super. All right, let's see here. Sarah, where did you go, Sarah? Um, questions are popping up really quickly now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sarah said, wants to know, uh, in your practice, how do you introduce individual clients to meditation, and what ongoing support do you provide? <coughs> Thank you. Um, <coughs> I introduce people at their own pace. Uh, different people come um, at different levels of being ready to sit quietly in mindful awareness. Uh, from each other. And so we take it at their own pace. Given permission to take it at their own pace usually helps people move faster into it. Some people come convinced that it's going to be really hard. I am always find that fascinating. <laughs> My answer to that is if it's going to decrease stress and create ease, it's going to be easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I've even worked, I worked with a group of uh, professors at uh, American University who were dealing with stress issues. And, I, and they said, we need something that we can just do really fast, something we can do. What could we, what could we just do? And I said, start with breathing. 
breathe deeply in, out, and watch yourself breathing. Well, they were very frustrated at this because that was too simple. That wasn't complicated enough. <laughs> so I, I preface this by saying if we're going to create ease, by definition, it's going to have to be easy. So um, in my own personal practice, uh, I start with the breath and lead to other forms of interoceptive awareness, awareness of the interior body. Um, that's particularly important when you do healing work um, to have that interoceptive awareness. Um, let's see. Have I, I think I've answered part mm -hmm. of the question. Was there, was there more to that? How do I use that in my own practice? Um, sure. How do people continue with the practice? Yeah, how, have, how, yeah how do you, how do you at, maintain some kind of... I'm at the Mindfulness of... Center. And at the Mindfulness Center, we have ongoing classes, um, which is an affordable way of, of maintaining a practice when you want guidance. And then the goal is that you're able to take that practice out of here and practice on your own. There's a plethora nowadays also of meditation CDs and online opportunities. Um, and many people start practicing at home. You f you'll find that some amount of guidance will deepen your practice. Um, and, in, and, and so I encourage you to get some kind of guidance from an experienced practitioner. Um, and make it a practice. Mm -hmm. Create a place in your own home or your office that's a sanctuary. That's a place where you go to practice. And I'm not going to tell you how long. You'll find that on your own, and that's important. But if it's a sanctuary, the place where you go to let go, relax, and meditate, it will draw you to it more and more often. It will deepen your practice just to have that place because it'll call to you because it'll be self-rewarding. It'll feel good when you go there, and it'll feel good when you're finished with your meditation. So uh, the practice is self, self-fulfilling, self-rewarding. Mm. So the, sort of the, there is no... There are no rules or requirements. Many people make rules, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> schools are full of rules. I could make some up, but I find it more effective to let you create your own. Again, it's that non-judgmental, non-opinionated. The only thing I'll recommend is that you try it. Hmm. Yes, Sandy was wondering, as a follow-up question to her previous one, is there a like a minimum? Is is three hours required to see some some uh, benefit from the practice? Uh, no, yeah. no. Um, I have days where my my practice is the five minutes that it takes me to get out of bed. <laughs> um, <laughs> so being quite quite fair, I have other days when it's a lot longer too. But um, I'm not going to set a minimum. Different people meditate different ways. Some people are regimented and they like to have their one hour in the morning. And some people meditate real early, 4.30 to 5.30 a.m., I've heard. Um, I'm not saying you need to do that. But some people just have their one hour every mm -hmm. day. It's got to be. Others will meditate periodically through the day. Take a 10-minute break in the morning instead of coffee. They go meditate. And a 10-minute break, you know, in, in, in a transition from work to going home. Uh, help reset the the clock, if you will. Um, so it's different for different people. So again, what I'll recommend is that you give it a try and get started. Mm. Yeah, it's because the 4.30 and the meditation instead of coffee, I promise you, will never work for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's so you get to choose your own, Michaela, and let us know what you chose. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, Nancy wanted to know... I'm sorry, go ahead. Make, uh, sometime when you're on vacation, try the meditation instead of coffee. Mm. Just one time. Just well, once. I'll think about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Nancy wants to know, how does an individual begin who really just can't even sit still and, and quiet their mind? Just a couple minutes of breathing? Yes. Yes. And use then... That's when having that point of focus really becomes useful. Having something to grab onto. Okay, I'm going to watch myself breathe for all I'm worth. Okay, I'm breathing. Oh, wow, my mind's bouncing around. But watch me, I'm breathing. Oh, wow, my mind's bouncing around. But I'm breathing. Then, then it becomes you know, very important to watch that focus. And also having a guide, having a voice that you're listening to, whether it's something online or a meditation CD that you buy or you come to a class somewhere having something to guide you, that mm. voice, that helps. Mm. 
Okay, Amanda says, um, meditation uh, seems to be perceived as intimidating among students, even though, you know, you can tell them the benefits. Uh, how do you encourage busy college students to just try? Hmm. Yeah, boring. That's what I hear. <laughs> boring. <laughs> I've got a 15-year-old boy. Are you kidding? Boring. <laughs> um, how do I encourage them to just try? Um, I've been teaching at the university level for 26 years now, and I have seen a dramatic increase in the number of emotional conditions, mental conditions, um, mental health conditions over that period of time. Stress has increased, and anxiety and depression and so forth have risen accordingly. And when things get out of control, when somebody's seeking help, when somebody feels a need for assistance or to improve their life, obviously then you've got a captive audience. Suggesting 15 minutes of meditation a day, several days a week, if it's got the potential to help, I see people respond to that. I see mm. people say, okay, I'll try that, thanks. Um, I've also, so, so in those situations, um, it's enlightening. I also see it catching on as a cultural thing, more of a fad. Um, at American University, people are getting together in groups to meditate. It's accepted. It's, it's sort of like a meetup or, or a jam or something. They get together mm -hmm. and meditate. Uh, something else of note, um, and I won't tell you exactly what generation I am, but in my generation when I was in school, they had nothing like yoga or meditation in school. Nowadays, the high schools have yoga classes. You can register for yoga as one of your classes to, towards graduation. Um, that's really a cultural shift. And I actually note from, from my position here at the Mindfulness Center that a lot of kids in high school are seeking us out on their own. Hmm. So it's it's growing as a cultural trend, and the children are picking it up, maybe because of their exposure to yoga, maybe their exposure to people from my generation. I'm not sure what, <laughs> but they're picking it up more and more. Hmm. Thank you for that question. Great. Laura um, would like to know, she said uh, she was intrigued by your the distinction you made between mindfulness and com uh, <laughs> com contemplation. Thank you. Yes, practice. I don't know why I couldn't spit that out. Um, and appreciated the description of mindfulness. However, um, I wasn't sure about the true distinction between contemplative practice. Could you clarify? Yes, yes thank you for that question, Laura. Um, contemplation is thinking about things. And I'll describe it in terms of what we see going on when we look at electrical activity in the brain. With contemplation, you see activity in the frontal cortex. You see the, the cortices blinking and being active, which is, by the way, in contrast to a much more um, rhythmic activity in the other parts of the brain, particularly the hindbrain that regulates emotions. And so you have a disharmony. It's, it's quite normal, but it's also it's a non-harmonious activity in these two parts of the brain. So contemplation is active thinking, asking questions, developing opinions, creating ideas, reviewing your to-do list. All of those things are contemplation. Contemplation can be done with the body in a very relaxed state, resting, no physical exertion, you're comfortable, it's peaceful. But it's something different going on in the brain from what mindfulness meditation is. And what that is, is clearing the brain of judgments, ideas, opinions, thoughts, and concerns. If they do pop up, don't have a judgment about a judgment, <laughs> or it just snowballs the whole thing. So if they do pop up, just note, oh look, there was one. And eventually the brain starts to clear. And what you start to see in the frontal cortex is this same rhythmic waveform that you see going on in the hindbrain. And the two become symphonic. They start 
fluctuating together. There, you see, if you're looking at an output from a brain, you see that they're harmonious. And what that feels like, if you then tap somebody on the shoulder and say, excuse me, I'm watching your brain, and what are you feeling just now? Hmm. What they report is they are who they want to be, and they want to be who they are. There's this internal harmony between our feelings and our thoughts. And it's a very different um, mental state or brain state, if you will. And it actually then creates a deeper physiological state throughout the body as you get these hormonal shifts that go through your whole system, systemic. So there's the difference mm. between the contemplative work and mindfulness meditation. Great. Um, well, it's funny that you should uh, mention that it seems to be taking off at, at American University and such. Uh, Jeffrey said, in teaching meditation and other stress management techniques to large groups of undergraduate students, um, why is it that cert a certain percentage, maybe 30 to 40 percent, report they very much dislike their efforts to try medi meditation uh, while preferring progressive relaxation or autogenic training. Any thoughts? Yes, I have a thought on that. <laughs> um, here's my thought. Um, whatever we do with our minds and our bodies, we get sort of in a rhythm. It's a, we, we develop a system, and it works for us. Maybe it worked for us in our childhood. Maybe it's working for us just now. But we develop habits and patterns that are distinctively ours, because they either worked in the past or are working just now. And there's things we hold on to. There's ideas we hold on to. There's fears we hold on to. And when you meditate, there's the potential to let go of these. And you're letting go of something that's been there possibly all your life that's been a crutch for you. So to let go of a tool that's been very useful, you know, like ruminating or obsessing on thoughts, um, or any or milder versions of that, um, mild forms of anxiety, and just just having a, a certain way of thinking uh, to let go of that. Uh, I've even worked with people who did TM and used mantras and and explored what happens when they let go of the mantra. Is disorienting to let go of a pattern of thought processing and simply sit with empty awareness in the brain. It's scary. There's a reason we held on to it in the first place. Every time we started to let go, it felt scary, so we clung back onto it. So to go through that, to relax and breathe deeply and to let go of certain thought processes, certain thought habits, it can be scary and it can be disorienting and it can even lead people to becoming um, dizzy or nauseous as the stomach turns for some people. So I, I will warn people of that. Um, I don't want to suggest it, but I will, on some occasions, warn people that in letting go, there's a reason they held on to it in the first place. There's a reason they clung to that. Are they willing to explore what happens if they do let go and go through, which I'll tell this audience, but I don't, not always so suggestive to my clients, go through feelings of um, imbalance, disorientation, <laughs> dizziness, nausea, those are some of the most severe things as you do let go. So that 30% that doesn't want to, that actually doesn't like it, as they do let go. And then discover what's on the other side. And grounding people, allowing them to feel a sense of security and safety or, or sometimes connectedness with the earth, feeling a sense of gravity, that often helps to recover a sense of balance. Thank you for that question, Jeffrey. Yeah, that was a really interesting question. I never thought about meditation or starting to try meditation is really, it sounds like part of it's about trust. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, it is about trust. Um, trust in yourself, because as you let go, it's your choice. You can stop doing that. You know, you can come back and, and tense or think. It's always your choice as to how much you want to let go. Mm -hmm. and well, well, we've got time for one more uh, question. Uh, from Andy, and um, I want to know how how to, how to meditate when he's tired. How to meditate what, when you're tired? Yeah, without risking just falling asleep. 
stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you could meditate standing up. Sit on a stool. <laughs> ah. Let me actually address that a little deeper. Thank you, Andy. Um, the body puts a premium on what it needs. If it needs sleep and you go into meditation, it will take it. And I don't chastise anybody who falls asleep during meditation. Um, if that's what you need, then sleep first and meditate later. Um, if for some reason you do want to meditate and not sleep, um, and, 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 let, and let me just once more reiterate, if you need sleep, by all means sleep. But if, if you want to stay awake, then simply sit on the front edge of your chair or lean forward or sit on a stool and um, note that you're tired and explore what it's like to be physically and, and mentally tired. Mm. Interesting. I hope that answered Andy's question. That was a good one. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll add on that because I realize we're at an end here that... I've sat in many lengthy meditation programs where the idea is to sit still and ignore physical issues, physical complaints like back pain and knee pain that, that develops when you sit in one position for a long time. I do not advocate that, and in talking about meditation's role in medicine and healing, I use meditation to explore what is going on, to become consciously aware of the physical body and its many messages to us. And in listening to those messages... They come to those mess the body speaks to us with messages for a reason. I advocate listening to them and finding ways this is the yoga of meditation, finding ways to make adjustments in the physical body, in the environment around you, in your life that leads to greater ease. Mm -hmm. And therein lays the, the clue to healing. Awareness leads to healing with the appropriate responses. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Michaela. Beautiful. I I uh I can't tell you how much, what a pleasure it's been. Um, and the information has been fabulous. Just listening to you talk, you have such a, such a calming voice. Thank you, uh, Michaela. I'd be happy to just lead a meditation with you <laughs> in your, your audience. That would be fun. Um, but we, we must go for today. Maybe we can, we, can, we should do that sometime. That would be quite that would nice. Be wonderful fun. And you have a wonderful audience. I've enjoyed their questions and their, their input. Um, if I could feel their energy, it feels wonderful. So thank you all. Oh, well. Thank you so much for being here. Um, let's see, this has been recorded and will be available on Health Promotion Live this afternoon. So please, actually we had somebody ask, could I send my uh, my uh, patients or whatever, I my users uh, to the uh, website to watch this? Sure, send anybody and everybody you want. I think this was a, a great presentation. Um, and, you know, the more the merrier. It's all there. It's all free. Um, and Debbie, I appreciate so much you being here. And, you know, I look forward to seeing you later in the year at the Mind Body DC, DC Mind Body Week. Um, yes, mindbodyweek.com tells all about the program that Michaela and I and others are putting together here in DC on the evidence basis for many mind body therapies. Thank you, mm -hmm. Michaela. So it's been a joy working with you, your listening audience, and HP CareerNet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.